Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Killer. And yeah, I'm gonna tell you what number here is known or might know about stable homotopy groups. Well, the answer to those questions that usually usually not that much. Uh, just kidding. Uh, I mean, what I really want to say is usually they think they might know, know not know that much, but actually they know the most important bits that constitute the stable homotopy groups. I kind of talked about these things a little bit earlier, and they are the central project of homotopy theory. And one of the reasons is because we can describe them in so many different ways. <coughs> so at the same time, these are the maps between spheres up to homotopy when the dimension is very large. It's also, uh, by a celebrated theorem, the algebraic key theory of finite sets. So it's something that encodes the combinatorics of finite sets. By the theorem of Pontryagin, it's also the same as cobordism classes of framed manifolds. So if you like manifolds, it's very difficult to classify them up to the theomorphism. You go for a, a smaller equivalence relation and the problem becomes more tractable. It becomes a problem in homotopy theory. And finding the perspective, which for us would be the most useful, there are these things called spectra, and that's the notion of a spectrum is a variation of a notion of a space, where in some sense we allow things to be suspended and desuspended at will, and that makes this very additive. So this tends to behave a little bit like R modules or a ring. It's, it's an additive category, and the sphere forms the monoidal unit, and the homotopy groups so these are the endomorphisms of the monoidal unit. So this brings the problem more into the realm of something like algebraic geometry. And in fact, most of stable homotopy theory is much closer to algebraic geometry. And as we'll see number theory, than it is to low dimensional topology, for example, or any kind of topology. So let's see a few of those groups. How do they look in low dimensions? So you get a feel for what kind of problem we're really after. Well, in dimension zero, we have the only infinite group, the integers generated by the identity of the sphere. And after that, there's a, a Z mod two, Z mod two, Z mod 24. That becomes more interesting than zero, zero, Z mod two. Then we have a Z mod 240. And uh, well, after the first one, all of them are finite. And now you might hope perhaps they're always cyclic. That's not true. The next one is Z mod two times Z. And so on and so forth. There's a clear pattern. You can fill this out. Oh boy, it's a <laughs> half audience. Well, that's also a little bit of a joke. There is no clear pattern. In fact, these are incredibly, incredibly difficult to compute. And there's something called the Mahold uncertainty principle, named after Mark Mahold, unrelated to the uncertainty principle in quantum physics, <laughs> which tells you that any algebraic approximation to the stable homotopy groups is infinitely far away from the actual answer. It's not a proven theorem, it's more like something you experience. You can find better and better ways to describe those, and yet you're always very far away. But nevertheless, there are some patterns. I'd like to tell you how we can see them. Well, the first one is all of them are finite. Finite beyond the first one. So that's the first obvious plan. That's the theorem of Sir and his field smell from the 50s. And the second one is a little bit more subtle. They're all finite. So you can split them into p torsion parts for each prime. And let's look where's the first place we have two torsion. The first time we have two torsion is in degree one. The first time I have three torsion, well, 24 is divisible by three, it's in degree three. And then the five torsion appears for the first time here in degree seven. And in fact, it's always true that the P torsion appears, appears for the first time in degree two P minus three, which is the formula we get. I didn't get to, uh, Pi 11, this is in fact it's the first time you see seven torsion. Okay, so like I said, those things can be approached by 
arithmetic by number theory. So what's the object of number theory that is relevant to this? That's what we call a formal group. A formal group. So do we get here or might say empirical evidence for low price? Do we have what? Do we get here or it's a empirical evidence for low price? That's the theorem of oh, this is a theorem, yes. No, no, this is and we're gonna see where this comes from precisely without a proof. So the formal group is a scheme which is isomorphic as a scheme, not as a group, to infinitesimal neighborhood. Neighborhood of the affine line. There's a small line here. It's really these objects are defined over a field or a ring. And it's not really a scheme to make sense of infinitesimal neighborhoods. We need to introduce formal schemes. Let's ignore that for a little bit. It's somehow relevant for the content of the stocks. What are some examples where you can start with just the affine line? Algebraically, the field you should imagine is the complex numbers. So it's something like this. Then you take this already has a multiplication, namely ordinary addition. And you can take a small neighborhood around that. That's what we call the additive form of group. Now we have one more. This worked because we started with something that was already a group and we passed to a small neighborhood where there's one more source of groups in algebraic geometry. You can start with an elliptic curve. It's an elliptic curve over a field. And again, pick a small neighborhood of the identity. That's again, that's going to be what we call an elliptic form of group. And now, if you draw them over C, and that's a very important part of the subject, you will notice this is actually the universal cover of this um, topology of the elliptic curve, in particular, they are locally isomorphic uh, around the identity as groups to the Lie algebra. And this is very important. In fact, if the field is of characteristic zero, these are isomorphic as formal groups. The important point is they are not isomorphic in positive characteristic, essentially because the exponential map involves division by a prime. And this already explains the first pattern to some extent. If we believe homotopy groups as someone with formal groups, formal groups are trivial and characteristic zero. And similarly, irrational homotopy groups are all trivial, except for the first. <coughs> okay, now we connect to an example that's more involved, but has something to do with homotopy theory. Let's say we have a nice limited algebra and spectra. So it's something that represents a cohomology theory with multiplicative structure. Similar to ordinary cohomology, there's a notion of a cup product. And let's assume we have churn classes. So there is a way to define churn classes of complex vector bundles in e cohomology. And to that, Quillen associates the Quillen formal group, which encodes the way the tensor product of vector bundles um, interacts with respect to churn classes. The construction is a little bit involved. So let's skip that. But the nice thing is usually this encodes the E cohomology for large classes of spaces. And when E is particularly nice, you can recover it completely from this formal group. So there are large classes of algebras and spectra which are completely encoded by the corresponding formal group. Unfortunately, the sphere is not, I mean, life is never that easy. The sphere is not that nice. There is no theory of churn classes in stable homotopy groups. But what we can do is we can resolve the sphere as a ring using homology theories with churn classes. This is, if you think of these dually, these are coordinate rings of some notion of a scheme, we're really finding covers of the sphere with a fine scheme associated to very nicely. So ease we can actually compute. Them. And from that, we get a spectral sequence. And the theorem which really describes the whole connection, this is one of the spectral sequences which Hala mentioned yesterday. Well, it computes 
the homotopy groups of spheres. But what starts what starts here is the cohomology of the moduli stack of formal groups with coefficients in a certain i bar. This is the moduli stack of formal groups. It's an algebra geometric object which parameterizes the way formal groups can arise. I'll take questions at the very end and I'll move on. So this tells you if we can understand formal groups and describe the object, the universal object which carries a formal group, then we're a spectral sequence away from understanding the stable homotopy groups themselves. So how do we understand formal groups? Well, it turns out in characteristic zero dual isomorphic and in characteristic E, we have the following invariant. We say that G over K, that's a positive characteristic now, is of height N. But the multiplication by K from G to G is a cover of degree P to the N. You can show it's always a cover, it's either zero or it's a cover of a finite degree, which is a power of P, and the height measures how exactly far is multiplication by P from being an isomorphism. In characteristic zero, it's always an isomorphism. That's why there's no interest in theory. And the theorem due to Lazar tells you that if you look at some G over K, positive characteristic and algebraically close up to isomorphism, and these are completely classified by their height. And the height can be any positive integer or infinite which corresponds to the multiplication by t is zero. In other words, there's no interesting theory in characteristic zero. In characteristic p, we have a complete invariant if we're over a field. If you're not over a field, those things can mix. But now the notion of a height gives you a way to decompose this moduli stack into strata corresponding to different heights. And to try to understand its cohomology, by understanding cohomology of each prime at the time. In fact, this decomposition can not only be performed here in the world of algebra, but there's a corresponding decomposition in the category of spectra itself. And the composition is usually known as the chromatic filtration, which is where the name of the subject comes from. What I'm talking about is called uh, chromatic homotopy filtration. I worked pretty hard to do this. Uh, I, I consulted the experts. So what I is the stable homotopy groups of spheres, and it gets split into parts corresponding to different heights. Here we have height zero. Below that we have height one. And what follows is well height two. Um, height three, and maybe let's stop here, height four. And it, it, divides the, it divides the problem of computing the stable homotopy groups, of figuring out the parts corresponding to each height. But of course, then they are in general non trivially linked. So then you have to figure out how they get glued. But in fact, the two patterns we see here all correspond to each height. The first pattern is this triviality of uh, formal groups in characteristic zero. Only formal groups in characteristic zero are of height zero, and they're all the same. So there cannot be anything interesting rationally, and that's the first pattern. Well, the second pattern is more involved. We just observe here, if you have a formal group of height n, then this map is gonna factor for the n uh, iterate of Frobenius, and you're going to see that the Lie algebra of G to the P to the nth power is isomorphic to itself. So there's a certain periodicity to the Lie algebra. And since this is precisely the line bundle which appears here, there's a certain periodicity in homotopy groups uh, at a specific height. Then all of those periodicities get mixed. Well, if n is equal to 1, the orange part at height 1, this is p to the uh, this is p minus one, and this gets doubled by two because they're t over two, and we get two p minus two. 
which is almost the 2p minus 3. Like there's a different spectrum mapping into the sphere where the first p torsion is in fact the degree 2p minus 2. It's the height one part. OK, thanks so much for listening. Questions? What do you know about the complexity of that sequence? Do you have any lower bounds which show that it's the principle you enunciated earlier is somehow? Um, one can, I mean, I know in terms of complexity and terms no, 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 not fancy complexity. Yes, yeah, so like in terms of the some, somehow that you show us that it's not almost periodic, it's not. Yes. If you fix a specific height, then in some sense, these homotopy groups related to that can be computed as cohomology of a certain piazza Lee group. So that's another way homotopy theory, uh, number theory enters. And this piazza Lee group is of dimension n squared. So here you have a one-dimensional Lee group, uh, cohomologically one-dimensional. Here it's already four, nine. And in practice, this picture is not quite accurate because as a field, we understand height zero and height one very well. And some people understand height two, the other two are already beyond human comprehension, computationally at least. We have a good picture. So I would say this is kind of the limit of human comprehension. <laughs> this is where the answers start to take a whole page, and that's not the proof that's the answer. So that makes you push into maybe the understanding should be more conceptual rather than computational. So this M. FG, this <clears throat> modular stack. Plot. So you, depend, you fix a characteristic, right? Um, and here you don't have to, it works at all characteristics. Okay, so but so yes, but if you want to define heights, the height filtration is right. only defined once you localize ah. the prime. There's a different filtration at each prime. Oh, I see. I see. And similarly, we compute the homotopy groups separately at each prime using this method. But because they're finite, they actually split into a direct sum of p torsion parts. So to compute them, there are very few integral calculations in, in this subject. It's always at a fixed prime. Any other question? Thank you again.